is a picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hi there, I'm Josh Weiss, and welcome to Crosstalk International. We are currently in the middle of our Passover series where my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss, has been going through his book, A Passover Backstory. Through this book, we're able to gain a better understanding of the history of Passover and the relevance this celebration still holds today. By the end of this episode, I hope that you'll be able to gain a better understanding of the Passover Seder itself. I'm going to give you a rundown of the celebration and highlight the important aspects of a Seder meal with the help of some examples from a Seder my dad led at a church in Oklahoma City. Before we get there, though, let me let my dad finish up some thoughts. Oh, my gosh. Dinner rolls. We're going to be excommunicated. Are Easter bunnies kosher? Jesus Christ. Who forgot the matzah? Wait a separate check, please. So having posed these awkward questions on this curious detour, I must now invite those who hear me to rejoin our twisted journey that is almost complete. We're very close to our Passover Seder destination. I promised to guide us to a sanctified ritual without being swallowed by retail religion. I'm asked challenging questions proposed challenging conclusions, and I still require some grace from my listeners and readers as we reach the end of our Passover backstory. Again, I ask a question posed earlier in this section of so many questions. Where's the comets? Where's the leaven in my life? In conclusion, we all have lemon in our life. We might think we can hide or sell our leaven, but it is revealed to any honest person that asks God for truth about their own spiritual condition. Nobody with leaven can truly take your leaven. It merely leaves two people with leaven. You see, one sinner cannot bear the sins of another sinner. Without blood on the doorpost, we bear our own penalties for our own disobedience. And herein is the true purpose of Passover. God made a way for us out of Egypt. He also made a way for us to be Pesadic. If you really want to be kosher for Passover, the only rabbi who can effectively take away your leaven is the perfect sinless rabbi who could afford the incredibly high price that we could never pay. Jesus, the Passover lamb of God, came to take away our sins. This is the only viable exchange that satisfies God. Now, most rabbis reject the concept. I propose that a blood sacrifice in exchange for sin is more realistic than money-changing hands to temporarily hide our leaven. As far back as Israel's wanderings in the desert, God made clear, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Later, the Bible described an entire system of sacrifices that fell off the calendar long ago when the temple fell and our sacrificial altar was destroyed. Most calendars now turn on the fulcrum of the resurrection of a man from that same time. That man allowed his blood to be shed for us. That sinless man was a spotless lamb, in my view. That is the only viable exchange that satisfies. His is the blood that covers us from the destroyer and delivers us forever. If you've been with us for a few weeks, then you've probably learned some of these things already, but it's probably helpful for a recap. Let's jump right in. Seder means order. My family celebrates Pesach, which is Passover. It's a little different than the way most Jewish families celebrate. See, my dad wrote this liturgy to help us carry on a tradition that must be remembered. In this way, 
The knowledge of God's faithfulness is shared with the next generation. As we say in Hebrew, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. This is something that I've heard Dad talk about many times over the years, which is what all Jews do. We try to pass the tradition on from one generation to the next. It's how we learn about the goodness of our God. To preserve our future, we share our past. A Seder plate is a plate that holds six items that symbolize a different part of the Passover story. I've got one right here on the table. Each of these festival elements are symbolic, but if the symbols aren't understood, then we fail to inform and educate the next generation about our shared history. So I wanna let my father jump right in and help him explain or allow him to explain to you the elements of the Passover Seder. So what I have here in front of me, I wanna make sure everybody can see this. This is a Seder plate and you have in front of you a plate that resembles it. There's a number of images and the images are symbolic. Everything that we do here tonight is about symbolism, but symbols have meaning. And it's important that we, uh, I think, recognize. So uh, I'm going to just identify what some of the things on the plate would be. This is a zeroach. It's a lamb shank bone. It's a roasted lamb shank bone. In the first Passover, God told Moses to do very specific things. And one of those things was to sacrifice a Passover lamb. It would have been called the Korban Pesach. It was roasted and it was eaten in a fraternal gathering that the family would gather. And it was at a time when the children of Israel were in great flux because they had been slaves in Egypt. And this was all all a very difficult. Uh, I'm sure there was chaos, confusion, uncertainty, but it, it becomes the primary symbol of our Passover Seder. You have uh, an egg, at, that's the beitza. Some scholars believe that the roasted egg uh, represented a, a mourning for the destruction of the temple. Uh, some take it to mean that it's uh, an egg represents uh, eternal light, the cycle of life, renewal, springtime. Personally, I think it represents the what's called the Korban Chagiga, and that was an additional festival sacrifice because the first lamb was eaten in, as I mentioned, a family gathering, and it was anticipated that a lamb would be suited for about 10 people, but the gatherings became larger, so they had to have additional sacrificed lambs for the Passover celebration. The rabbis had some interesting views. Uh, they determined that everybody had to have a piece of lamb at least the size of an olive. And the thought behind it was everybody was supposed to have enough to eat. I think those rabbis operated Weight Watcher franchises on the side. <laughs> I, did, I don't know. Yeah. So another item that is represented on the Seder plate is the karpas. And you would have some carrots or some celery. This is parsley. Uh, it's it's a, an item that 
It has greens on the top. So I'll discuss that a little bit more later, but that's, there's a purpose to each symbol, and we'll, we'll identify them as we go through the Seder. There is karosis, and by the way, it's a mixture of chopped apples, nuts, wine, and spices, and there's a purpose to it. It also is a symbol. It reminds us of the bricks and mortar, the mortar that my people used to build as slaves in Egypt. And there's a group of leading medical professionals who recently published a report warning, and this is very serious, that Seder participants should not partake of both chopped liver and harosis together. Their findings suggest that doing so can lead to harosis of the liver. <laughs> and it gets worse from there, folks. It gets worse. He's laughing, though. He, he's laughing. <laughs> okay. So we also have maror. And you have little finely chopped pieces of maror, but they're actually chopped from a, a horseradish root. And a horseradish is one of the uh, items that are used to represent uh, maror, a bitter herb, and it symbolizes the bitterness of slavery that my people experienced. And by the way, as if you are not Jewish, but you have embraced Jesus as Messiah, you're adopted into this family. And so we have a heritage that goes way, way back. And during this Seder, we will discuss that we were slaves in Egypt. And I hope that we can each personalize that. I hope that was helpful for you. And if you didn't catch it all or you'd like to learn more about it, you can always get it in a Passover backstory and read through it so you can make sure and teach your next generation about these same things as God instructed. The next part of the Seder, the mother or any female is asked to recite the blessing and light our candles to welcome in this wonderful festival. God said, let there be light. And with the Lord, the mother makes light too. After the candles are lit, a prayer is recited in Hebrew. You can read along if you have the book. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kedushanim v'betzvatav, v'tzivanu lahad ligner shel yom tov. The English translation reads, Blessed art thou, eternal our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through thy commandments and instructed us to kindle the holiday candles. Amen. Those that are participating in a Seder partake in drinking four cups of wine or grape juice at different points throughout the Seder. Some believe that four cups of wine are enjoyed in a Seder to, in remembrance of the four aspects of redemption that God promised in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Each aspect of God's deliverance is celebrated. We will sip four cups of wine, grape juice. This interpretation is not universally agreed, but no one should doubt God's liberating deliverance. The first cup is to liberation. I will free you from your burdens in Egypt. The second is a cup to deliverance. I will deliver you from slavery. The third cup is a cup of blessing or redemption. I will redeem you. And the fourth cup is a cup of completion into true freedom. I will take you to be my people. Various times throughout the Seder, we take what is called matzah. This is a, a cracker-like object that represents bread, and it's made without leaven. Passover is known in the Bible as the festival of unleavened bread. When the Israelites were fleeing Egypt, they didn't have time to properly cook their bread and add leaven to allow the bread to expand. This is where matzah comes from. And we continue this tradition of eating unleavened bread during the Passover celebration as God commanded Moses in Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. It says, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it is on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The next part of the Seder, we break what is called the Afikomen. 
<clears throat> this is such an important part that I'd really like to let my dad explain it to you. So I'm going to allow dad to do just that from that live Passover Seder we mentioned earlier. So what I have here is my grandmother's matzatash. A matzatash. This one is really old, and it actually has some of the same symbols on the cover. But inside, there are three little compartments, and there's a matzah in each of the three compartments. Now, some believe that the three matzot represent the three groups of Jews that would be identified, the, the priests, the Levites, and the run-of-the-mill Yisraelim. I have taken the middle matzah, and by the way, the, the middle matzah has a name. It's not Sydney or George or Marcia. It's the Afi Coleman, and that has a meaning. It, it, it sort of means that which comes after. Now, some view it as similar to dessert. Dessert comes after. But when we consider the Messiah, who will certainly come after, this symbolism becomes rather profound. According to the rabbis, the afikomen is to be broken, and I am going to break it. And by the way, Ava, you can pay attention to this, okay? Okay, now, I have broken the middle matzah, and I've got my eye on this, and, and I fully expect you to steal one half at a time when I'm not looking. But I'm going to know... It's gone, and I'm going to know you can't fake me out because I have memorized the break. And I'm going to put them right back here into the matzotash, right in the middle. So you know it's there, right? Okay. It's broken. The afikomen, according to the rabbis, is broken at this point in the Seder, and we hide it away. It is hidden in my grandmother's matzotash. Later in the service, it will be revealed again when it is ransomed. Me and Ava are going to make a deal later. You'll see. It will be ransomed after our meal prior to the conclusion of the service. Now, Many have identified the obvious symbolism of Jesus in the matzah. Just like Jesus, our matzah is striped and it is pierced. I do love that. I think it's pictorial. And there's been many who have ministered on that idea of it being striped and pierced. And you may wonder, why is the matzah striped and pierced? And I have to tell you, that's the way Manischewitz made it. And that's just the way it is. Because matzah didn't look like that in the first century. In fact, uh, it was always, uh, there's a tool called a reedle, and they would roll this thing with little points on it, like a gear. They would roll it over uh, the the dough so that it it would have little holes in it so it would be perforated so it would get, the moisture would be released and it wouldn't rise uh, but it didn't look like that in the first century but what i will say is what has just occurred i have broken that this unleavened bread is broken for us Part of it will be recognized and on display. Part of it will be hidden from view. When it is time for the Athikomen at the end of this service, we will partake of this unleavened bread. Remember, Athikomen means that which comes after. And our Messiah declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
it is a privilege to come and tell you that a perfect lamb was led to the slaughter. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah described him so we would know him when he was revealed. Pastor, would, would you like to read on page 13 from Isaiah? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. This is often called, the Matzot is often called the Lechem Oni, the bread of affliction. And that becomes the Afikoman. It will be a reminder of our blessed hope when served as our communion at the conclusion of our Seder. We will have communion before we're done, and it will be from the bread and the wine of the Seder. The whole idea of a sacrifice is central to what we as believers in Messiah Jesus understand. In temple days, sacrifices were the method for atonement. That atonement is no longer possible on an altar at a temple that no longer exists. But God made a way and provided a perfect sacrifice in Messiah Jesus. We see the lamb shank bone and we're reminded of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The matzah is also to remind us of what has taken place. It's, it's an important representation. One Jewish thinker suggests if one of the three matzot signifies our liberation from Egypt and the second, the messianic redemption yet to come, the middle matzah stands for our present situation in between. We break off a piece and hide it as redemption is still hidden from us. Though because of Exodus, we know that it is there. And before the end, certainly find it. All eat of it and so taste the redemption yet to come. And it will be with the taste of that afikoman that we will leave the Seder and okay. to go with the taste of redemption on our lips. So, I will remind you again of the three matzot and the Magid section that we approach now is the telling of the story. It begins in ancient Aramaic. Visitors were often invited to join in the family Seder and Aramaic would have likely been the language in which the story was communicated. So this portion of the Passover story is retold in Aramaic. Halachma anya diachalu ahavtana the Artsad the Mitzrayim called it vin yete viechol called it rich yete vifso vifsach hasata hachav l'shana haba'a be'ar ad di Israel hashata avdei l'san l'shana haba'a v'neicho rein. You can read with me after the Megid. This is the bread of affliction which our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Whoever is in need, come and celebrate Passover. Today here, but next year in the land of Israel as sons of freedom. In the Apocrypha, Passover was called the Feast of Sweet Bread. It is sweet to all who know the sweet taste of freedom. But we must remember the slavery from which we've been redeemed. Affliction and sweetness makes sense in the context of sacrifice and salvation. Our Passover lamb was afflicted. When our names were inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Sefer Chaim, his affliction became sweet to the redeemed. Free people ask questions. We continue our Seder with questions. 
The custom is that one of the youngsters at the table chants the four questions in Hebrew. Since we all should ask the questions, I figured we would go through them right now. The questions are, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened bread and matzah. But on this night, we eat only matzah. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of herbs. But on this night, we eat mainly bitter herbs. On all other nights, we do not even dip once. But on this night, we dip twice. On all other nights, we eat sitting straight or reclining. But on this night, we all recline. The Torah speaks of four types of children. One is wise, one is wicked, one is simple, and one does not know how to ask. There are four passages in the Torah that command us to teach our sons about the Exodus. The four sons here in reference ask their question in a different way. Each son is therefore answered according to the way that the question is asked, but always referring him back to the Torah. The wise one asks, what is the meaning of the laws and traditions God has commanded? You should teach him all the traditions of Passover, each to the last detail. The wicked one asks, what does this ritual mean to you? By using the expression to you, he excludes himself from his people and denies God. Shake his arrogance and say to him, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. For me, not for him. For had it been in Egypt, he would have been freed. This is declaring a very serious implication. It presumes the wicked son does not really deserve to receive the benefits of the Seder because he would not have been considered worthy to be freed from slavery in Egypt. The simple one asks, what is all this? You should tell him, it was with a mighty hand that the Lord took us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. As for the one who does not know how to ask, you should open the discussion for him as it is written. On that day, explain to your son, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Well, not to disappoint, but we're not going to finish the entire Seder in this one episode. And that's not really unusual because when we do the family Seders around our, uh, our family table, it takes quite a while in the evening and we're kind of flying through it. So I really want to encourage you, take time, go look at the website, crosstalk.org or randyweiss.com and look at a Passover backstory. There's a free download for you there. You can and get it there in PDF form, or of course you can, you can order it. I want to encourage you to come back next week. We're going to continue this teaching on the Passover Seder and uh, of course, walk through the rest of the elements of the Passover. And so I want to invite you back. Uh, same time, same channel, and of course, you can always find us online at the website, crosstalkinternational.com or crosstalk.org. So you can reach out to us, social media, at Crosstalk TV, uh, whatever you would do. I would encourage you to reach out and touch base with us. Let us know you're out there and that you're enjoying these programs. And if we can be a blessing to you, don't hesitate to let us know how. Of course, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so any contributions are appreciated. And until next time, shalom and God bless.